Welcome to the Pop Filler Podcast. My name is Philip. Before we do anything else, let's check the mailbag. Leona N. writes in about a little import from across the pond, Rankle Road. This show has been the topic of many conversations lately, though I personally still haven't ever checked it out. Sorry, Leona. I don't have anything constructive to add, but I want to read your letter because it has some interesting thoughts that I think viewers can absorb and consider. She writes, I've been fascinated by the latest season of Rankle Road. What's being captured there is a guttural feeling of ugliness. The show is holding up a mirror to its viewers' faults, our faults. We spend so much energy trying not to think of ourselves in an unflattering light, but we've been lukewarm mannequins standing idly with backs turned to the forces we tell ourselves we can't control. It reminds us how helpless we act like we are, even though we were capable enough to control these same forces in order to form our current world. So the show ends up condemning our attitude as inherently selfish. We thought we'd be living in that brighter tomorrow, but here we are in 2018, hamstrung for justice in almost every pocket of society, and Rankle is just shoving our faces in it. That's what powerful, effective shows can do for children. Kids are the audience learning these things firsthand at an impressionable age, and the imagery non-narratively conveys all of life's most important, hard-won lessons. No apologies, no punches pulled. If every child under four watches this show, I believe in a truly brighter tomorrow because that generation will know what darkness looks like, and more importantly, what it feels like. Thanks, Leona. That sounds interesting. I'll be sure to check it out. I've heard the little talking pelican is especially entertaining. Okay, now every once in a while, I like to do this. Let's take a little stroll through the Pop Filler Curiosity Shop. curiosity shop there are many wondrous things to behold yes I remember that one over there <laughs> these are getting a bit dusty I'll be honest I'm not wandering aimlessly through these narrow aisles I've pre-selected today's item so let's get right to it ah yes this is what I was looking for what I'm holding is a fur covered toilet seat now I don't know much about the history but I do know it's very old and I know that it's graced the bottoms of many fine people from late 19th century New Jersey, from the time that it resided in a small water closet in the Newark home of Christopher Lyons, a successful attorney who also happened to come from some means. He had a taste for the finer things, and that taste didn't end at the toilet. An item like this was something of a rarity, but not completely unheard of for that time and region. As you can imagine, New Jersey winters can get pretty cold, so I'm sure this seat was a welcome companion when conducting one's business in a drafty water closet. This particular seat is fitted with rabbit fur, still quite soft, and it smells like... Well, I can tell you what it doesn't smell like. Fur. How about you? Do you wish you had a fur-covered toilet seat? Well, this one is unfortunately out of commission, but you can always come by and see it at the Pop Filler Curiosity Shop. Dear Diary, I recently went to the dentist for a teeth cleaning. During this visit, I was also due to get x-rays. My hygienist pulled the machine out of the cabinet and put it into position to blast the right side of my face. She placed the lead apron over my chest and inserted the plastic-wrapped bite block in my mouth. When she wheeled over to the computer, I kept waiting for the beep and snap sounds to go off, but they never came. The hygienist did a lot of clicking and typing on the computer behind my head and finally let me know that sometimes it takes a little while to get everything to sync together. I understand troubleshooting, but I have a fairly sensitive gag reflex, and my salivary glands were really starting to kick in. I focused on breathing through my nose and tried to tilt my head back a little to limit the amount of drool that spilled onto the lead bib. 
After another minute or so of clicking around, the hygienist removed the horse bit from my mouth and restarted the machine. Whatever she did this time seemed to work. After replacing the bite block in my mouth, she began snapping away. The rest of the visit was very routine. I tensed my body during the polishing portion, and whenever prompted, I responded to the hygienist's small talk through monosyllabic sounds. When the dentist came by for his 30 seconds at the end, he was his usual self, equal parts vaguely friendly and incredibly distant. He always makes me feel like a stray eyelash you might regard on your hand before blowing it away. Still, dental health is important, and I'm grateful to have the insurance and the biannual cleanings. We'll speak again soon, Diarrhea. Yours, Philip. Before we move on, I'd like to just make a quick music recommendation. I'd recommend the new record from Gina Labore entitled Ricketts, Plaid, and Serious Mice. I think I like it so much because I don't really think she's had anything like this in over 30 years. And unlike other artists who give the impression of having creatively plateaued decades ago then attempting to continue selling the same ideas with a fresh cone of paint slapped on, with Labore we're actually getting a brand new structure that builds on the ideas and foundations of her earliest work. So yeah, there's paint on this one, but it's not your parents' paint. This is two to three coats of freshly mixed lead-free no VOC Paint Plus Primer. It's got a really nice matte finish, and it's delicious. It's so fresh you could lick it off the walls as soon as it's been applied. I find that paint is best licked off the walls the same way it's applied, with a roller. I'd ideally use a medium to high density roller cover to make sure you're getting good even coverage that will remove the paint evenly as it enters your mouth. When you've had your fill, rinse and spit with a little thinner. Try not to swallow, even if you like the taste. Ricketts Plaid and Serious Mice, check it out. Okay, lastly, it's time for another household tip. Well, this week we're back in front of the sink. Have you ever turned on the faucet to be greeted by just a small dribble of water? There are few situations that leave a person feeling more betrayed and helpless. There's so much to wash off. Bacteria, dirt, grime, Doritos dust. The blood of an enemy, the blood of a friend, the blood of a you. The sick truth is, sometimes your water gets shut off. Maybe you didn't pay a bill. Maybe there's an issue with your landlord. Maybe your landlord didn't pay a bill, and you reap the punishment because of his or her neglect. That's never happened to me with any past landlords, but I can only imagine. Recently, the water was shut off in our home. We could easily see out the front window that the city was working on the water lines down the street. It came back on a little later, and the city was courteous enough to come by and let us know that they would have to shut it off again in about 30 minutes. They weren't sure how long it would be off, but their hope was no more than two to three hours. We immediately went to the bathroom and emptied our bodies of all waste. After confirming successful flushes and tank refills, we began filling up pots, pans, and bottles with water. We also filled and set out wide, shallow bowls to be used as washing basins like the olden days. The water was turned back on in about two to three hours, and we had a lot of unused clean water sitting in pots, pans, and bottles. We tried to use some of it to water plants and refill the dog's bowl. It was an adventure in both conservation and waste. My main takeaway from that experience and today's tip is this. If you know your water is about to be turned off, be sure to fill up a wide, shallow bowl with water to be used as a washing basin like in the olden days. Okay, that's it for this week's Pop Filler. Thanks for listening, and remember, you'll be fine. 